Oh, that was better, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, we've all got some interesting ideas. I want to give you a little bit of a view of my own journey, as you might call it, um, my experience of using sort of this whole approach of uh, a scholarly activity to help get some very, very interesting results across all of the stakeholders, pretty much, that we've talked about. So starting off with my own career objectives. Right at the very top, if you look through those three, there's nothing about teaching. Except that first one is teaching. I do not teach, I inspire. The students learn, you cannot teach people. You take horses to water, you cannot make them drink. So as an educator, that is what I do. I mentor the students, I don't teach them anything. I point them in the right sort of direction, I give them huge sets of questions. Right at the very beginning of any module where the new students, I pose a question to them right at the very beginning of the very first lecture or seminar. Do you expect me to teach you answers or questions? And that sets off an interesting debate. I started it about six, eight years ago when I was teaching on the University of Derby Mass MSc in Strategic Management out in Africa. Well, so you were teaching there. <laughs> sort of, <laughs> but I'm not teaching them answers, I'm teaching them questions. Because we've commented, the knowledge changes, the specific answers change pretty much every week or two. So if I teach you an answer, you stop learning because you know the answer. But the answer changes with time because of technology of the domain. But answers also change because every situation is different. Or probably different. So you need to understand what the questions are so you can ask the right questions in the context to gain good answers. We don't have to get the best answers. That's unachievable. So that's the first bit. I reckon I'm there to guide my students in what they need to learn point them in the right direction, give them, point them in the right direction for the resources, set them some challenges, and then they go learn as they need to. <clears throat> Isn't there another level of abstraction here? Not teaching them what the questions are, but teaching them how to ask questions. To think. You can also do that as well. That's even more important, ultimately. And that's what some of us do in setting some of the challenges to, set, to help the students to understand how to identify questions, which is what we do with independent studies. We get them basically to work out what the question is going to be that they're going to answer if they do a successful project. Does that apply to all disciplines? I've been challenged on this one. I believe I, it is correct because, for example, a physicist will say, oh, the law of gravity, M1, M2 over something or other equals the answer. Yes, it is an answer, but it doesn't. But it help, if you look at it properly, it's actually ultimately a question. A lead ball and a feather in an atmosphere, they don't land at the same time. In a vacuum, they will do. So what is wrong? What's happening? So it helps you to think about other questions when you see things happening which that doesn't answer. And I got a very, very interesting aunt, um, example of that. How many of you know of the Hyperloop train concept? Elon Musk's amazing idea to travel at a thousand miles an hour between San Francisco and Los Angeles in 35 minutes, about a thousand kilometers an hour, in a tube with near vacuum. Now, there's a prototype evaluation set, um, event happening sort of around about this autumn, and various different teams of engineers and otherwise <coughs> have built various bits of the kit to try and prove out what's going on and whether it will work. And there's a group of uh, kids from MIT, engineering students, who have built a prototype of the little um, train gadget. 
suspended on magnets on an I beam. And about I think about six or seven weeks ago, um, they released a sort of PR uh, video. You can see it on YouTube. And it, uh, this is what we've got. We'll be demonstrating down at the challenge. And in the discussion that followed, the, lead, the student who was leading the project said, oh, of course, the problem with the hyperloop is you can't go around corners. It will only go straight. And then, when you think a little bit about it, why on earth would they be saying that? Because probably they come up with some maths a little bit about the suspension of magnet magnetic suspension that keeps it sideways and vertical, and we hadn't thought about the question. Because all of us know, who think about it, that if you're a maglev on an I-beam, you can go around corners perfectly happily. The I-beam just rides up around the corner and you tilt the train. You just have to do a little bit of careful, clever electronics with the uh, magnetic suspension control systems to maintain the clearance on the I-beam sides and on the top. And centrifugal force and centrifugal force and so on and gravity will bank you beautifully around the corner. How come a team of MIT engineering graduates or undergraduates did not understand that that was the case? <clears throat> Why were they up? Because they believed an answer, not as a question. largely that what we teach them as university doesn't necessarily prepare them for the real world and there is something mechanical engineering civil. In yeah. which case there's something catastrophically wrong with the way that we're teaching pure abstract knowledge with no connection with the real world outside. I would suggest that everyone in here, electronics, computing, maths, all that we teach can lead to a better understanding of how the world works and therefore how what we're teaching them should link to their future careers. Everything that we're doing in electronics, computing and maths, in principle, we can teach it as connected to the real world of employment. Okay, so you say, okay, it's pure maths, where is the connection? Most of our pure, some of the pure maths leads into really high grade theoretical research. That's part of the job. Some of us are a bit like that, perhaps. But most of us doing computing, electronics, maths, ultimately we are looking for us, many of our students to go out and be really great, effective, productive employees who are capable of learning for the rest of their life. Not making any assumptions that, oh, if I've got an idea set up like that, it can only go straight. This, going to the second one, one of the things is, we have historically had rather a lower feel or opinion of where we as the University of Derby are. I think we need to revisit that. Just because five years ago we were number 100 or 100 and something at the bottom of the league table, oh, and we get very bad students with about 10 UCAS points or something, being a bit cynical, we can still challenge our students to become some of the brightest. We challenge them to, be, to surprise themselves. We're now up at, what, about 50th in the league table? That's somewhat over halfway to the top of the lead table, we're getting good. For the last couple of years, Richard and Nick have given me one of the challenges has been to raise the profile of the University of Derby as we have been developing data science and, and big data analytics curricula. And I've been to a lot of conferences, and you'll see, again, in terms of consequences, some of what I've achieved Positioning the University of Derby, at least in the field of governance and analytics, is a different place to any, almost any other university in the country. Well, my third career objective is to enjoy what I do. And I'll go on tip here until either I'm thrown out or 
I lose the enjoyment. So from my perspective of scholarly activity, I do two things that kind of bridges the TEF and the REF approach. Looking at how to teach the things that make it work. And then so domain as well. We're using some amazing new tools that IBM are letting us have for free. Watson Analytics, we use other products as well, SAS, leading edge uh, tools for visualizing data and analyzing data. And that's kind of captured in this montage I put together here of about a dozen different little pictures of analytics over the last century and a half. So to learn how to do better, to think about teaching and what it's about, what students are achieving as they learn, and also very much domain-related knowledge. So what, what have I done in the last four years? Very brief journey. Started in full-time back in computing in 2012. And one of the things that's been very, very interesting in the last three or four years is think very much about my role as an academic. Am I here, in front of students particularly, as a domain expert? Someone who knows most about, more about analytics and governance than any, than any of them? Or am I going to look at myself as an academic who is good at learn, uh, understanding how to, what learning to learn is all about. So I'm there in front of my students now, leading them to say, look, I know some about well, the key issues, the key questions about analytics, about governance, but by the time you finish as an undergraduate, you're going to individually know more about analytics or about governance in a practical individual situations, individual context, than I do. I want them to exceed my knowledge. I'll learn from them. But I want each student to actually learn more about my domain than I know. 2013-14, I started using something called learning analytics to start looking at what was happening as a result of this change from the domain expert, I'm going to ram all of that lovely knowledge I have in my head into your heads, lads and girls, so at least you catch up with me. Changes from that this, to this other approach of I'm going to coach you, I'm going to mentor you, I'm going to help you to understand what learning is about, how you're going to achieve research, and so on. And I used learning analytics to actually start identifying what was actually happening, to find out whether my approach actually worked. Because previously, well prior to 2012, 2013, I very much was this domain expert and I really had all this lovely knowledge that you've got to uh, absorb. And as we know, teaching doesn't work terribly well, lectures don't work terribly well, and maybe there's other ways that help them to understand the domain better. And the learning analytics showed that what I was doing, in contrast to almost all of the other modules in the university, apart from a small number, which had, where, wait a minute, I'll come, where the black minority ethnic international students, traditionally in the, U, in the UK and in the University of Derby, had about a 25% deficit in their grades compared to the white UK. On my modules, that gap vanished. That has some, and that, I will show you some interesting consequences from that as well. Then in terms of domain expertise or domain research, I tripped over a little fact in September, of October, July up to September 2014, that the accuracy of location services on these gadgets is kind of pretty iffy. And that led to some other consequences in how I got my students to start doing some interesting research. <coughs> Which led to, a month later, rather than just accepting you know, half a dozen or a dozen students, 30 students, who all dreamt up 
fairly weak, but it's a normal sort of um, dissertation project topic. So I said, I'm going to have a single project. If you want to be supervised by me, this is the subject. You can refine it, you can narrow it down to a particular area, but you will only do this. This is the only research I'm prepared to supervise. And for the last couple of years, that's been the case. And we've got the, that also has had some very, very interesting consequences. In A, the work they're doing, B, the university reputation, and C, my own personal reputation. Now, so that's the journey of changing and various other things. A little side comment about the style of management in the two organisations I've, I've worked in. Manage, uh, business uh, school, which I was in for about four or five years, which was a seriously managerial <coughs> approach. And just as a brief introduction, management science has two particular views <coughs> of what senior people in an organisation do, and the middle levels and so on. One is managerialism, repeatability, um, control, and so on and so forth. And the second side is the idea of leadership. Set the broad objectives and then inspire. While I was in the business school, very, very, very managerial, tight control, you had to ask permission by and large to do things. You were kind of encouraged to take risks, but woe betide you if that risk didn't pay off. When I moved into computing and maths, it was rather different. Kind of objectives, but not the usual sort of, sort of management by objectives, but this is the kind of direction I want you to go. I want you to use your professionalism to come up with interesting new ways, new ideas. And if you fail, well, you'll learn something. As well as if you succeed, you will have learned something. But it was, if you fail, you will learn, not you will have your legs cut off. And that was an incredibly refreshing new approach uh, to come up with. So, pedagogy. I'm going to just do three little sections, I think it is. What number are we in? Yeah, about three or four sections. So, nowadays, as academic, as learning to learn expert, I am giving my students the ability to learn through their own personal research. And by giving big challenges that they refine to smaller size, individual challenges, that they then go and learn what they need to learn within that area. As long as it meets the learning outcomes and all the other things that you have to do. I've also, because of the fact that I'm now hardly using lectures except for one first year module which is too big to cope with in this. Most of the work in teaching is done in small groups in 20s, uh, seminars and workshops, which means I can dramatically increase the amount of individual contact with each student. I've also done this using learning analytics to sort of look at the numbers. It doesn't take any effort because I capture all of the data on the spreadsheets while, I, while I'm marking. And you just run it through. We can use Excel just to sort of work out what's happening. Where are the successes? What's changing? It just feeds straight into the end of term module reports. And yeah, I video record everything like I'm video recording this. So it's up on the internet on the YouTube channel so other people can see it. The students can look at the lectures or the seminars, the workshops, or well, the seminars and the lectures, and refresh their memories. And they like it. This was some work I did about well, two, three years ago. These are beginning academic years, so that's 2013-14. So that goes up to August or June, July uh, 2014. And you can see how this is the old style teaching, academic as a domain expert, and then migrating through to the academic as learning to learn, and changing 
uh, achievement levels overall, which is the grey line, and then the green, blue is a BMEI, and the orangey is a white UK students. I haven't had time to put in the other two years' worth of data up here, um, but it's most of it, not all of it, but most of it is up at that level. These are the percentages of getting for two ones, uh, first and two ones. By the way, the uh, PDF of these slides is already up on uh, my personal webpage on computing.derby.ac. Um, UK, and um, so you're going to get these very easily. I'll send the link out later. So Jeff, what happened to the mark for the BMEI students between 2007 and 2011? I'm not entirely sure. I haven't got enough history of what was actually going on there. Exactly. We've also got a, a nasty blip on a year two module um, last term, last year, um, where the numbers dropped pretty badly, and we don't fully understand that yet but got some ideas. Um, it's not always going to be successful, and occasionally you get groups of students who, for whatever reason, don't respond terribly well to anything, and even to this approach. A different way of looking at it over the, um, the, the many years, to see how the, um, the averages and the distribution uh, lay out. The consequences were of this change approach in the publicity and the analysis and so on. One has been that this year I was one of three academics from the university who've been put forward for the HEA National Teaching Fellowship Award uh, or scheme. Won't know for a couple of months yet whether I've been successful, but I've at least been put forward, uh, which is kind of interesting. A chapter in an edited book by one of our ex um, External uh, examiners, Mark Anderson, on developing effective education experiences. And that was actually what brought me to the attention of, um, <coughs> or partly to the attention of um, the university for that. Now being a regularly invited keynote speaker to a particular university uh, uh, conference in Toronto, um, where they want me there specifically to talk about this approach to um, learning and inspiration and research and running workshops there as well. And I have a session over at Portsmouth University in December that came out of the blue about this topic. So almost all of that is external recognition, raising the uh, profile of the University of Derby and that, and one or two others, have obviously led to that. I don't know where that came from, why it happened, it just did. Um, presumably the publicity um, and stuff out on the web is doing that. I also learned something with learning analytics which was kind of interesting and valuable about the way that I set up the assignment. And at week eight, I cancel all formal teaching, what you might call learning contact, and replace it with a formative review of their, quote, final draft for their assignment. Marked on the rubric on various criteria which they were introduced to at the very beginning of the semester. And this shows the grade improvement or percentage marks improvement as a result of that formal re formative review. Because then they have four weeks in which they then take on board the um, review because they'll have 10 minutes with me in my office, and I go through their site, their draft, annotate it, and turn it in, and then four weeks later they submit it, and we can see that they, one, or two, one person or two people went backwards by mistake, but almost everybody else improved by an average of about 15 to 20 points. The mark that they got at the formative review stage, week eight, is typically the sort of mark profile that we get for final assessments normally. By doing that review and using learning analysis, I can see now exactly what is happening. They are dramatically improving the, the output. They're being given questions about their topic, their approach to their topic that they can incorporate and develop in those remaining four weeks. 
And they also are improving the quality of presentation quite dramatically as well. So they become more acceptable types of writing for when they go out into the big wide world. So learning analytics is really kind of useful to help you understand what you are doing. And then this semester, or this last semester, learning analytics identified another somewhat bizarre um, result. That attendance, you know we are, keep on being hammered about attendance, we've got to get the students attending workshops, lectures, seminars, 90 odd percent or better. This suggests that um, as long as they appeared at the final formative review, whether they attended 20% of the time or 100% of the time has remarkably little impact. So learning analytics can actually teach you or help you to identify some really interesting other stuff. And as you'll see, the line fit here, R is not, R squared is 0 0.037, which is kind of no fit at all. That was a shock to me when I saw that one. A second point, and this is to do, came out of, comes out of the new ref stuff as well, students contributing to research. Students as co-producers. Now, in the pedagogic field, co-producing is used both in terms of students doing research and also students helping to develop course material and, deliver, and maybe to deliver it as well. I'm looking at here just at the moment purely in the co-producers as research. What I'm getting that the, our undergraduates to do, by having that single focus for independent studies and using that same focus in many of the questions that I pose in terms of assessments, are related to location services accuracy. Because the location services on your mobile phone are being used by large numbers of apps for businesses out there uh, and other ways to try and find out how to target you as a user, how the uh, advertising and so on. And it turns out that there are interesting reputational vulnerabilities and risks as one. So you can look at it in terms of ethics and governance. You can look at it in technologies in terms of advanced analytics uh, and other te techniques and sort of statistics. And so you can focus everything you do and everything your students do in your own modules back into your own research area that helps deliver. With this approach, I've now got enough data already for us to be the leading institution in the world in terms of understanding accuracy of location services on smart devices. The other thing is, by using a careful approach to the design of the assignments, the assessments, and then we can get quite a lot of student publications. We get student publication capability out of first, second, third year students in terms of their modules, which by choosing their, the best of the assignments of each year, and then hopefully managing to find a student who's prepared to do the editing into a formal publication which goes up onto uh, university websites. And also, of course, we publish online the best dissertations. Dave runs a website where, as the students submit their dissertations, a second submission goes on to our open journal system, and then he will release those which are 60% of the bubble, 70% of the bubble, 65% of the bubble. So high to one and first. And my, so my, many of my students are already there on that, but they also are a, tap there, a copy of their dissertation is included on the web pages that I have um, of the, where they're contributing again to LBS. <coughs> so there's a lot of publication going on there. And the trigger for this location says was a set of little photos. Here I was at a conference and I know that I was there and I took a set of photos and these ones here were 22.9 kilometres in error. I was standing in TK Maxx one evening afternoon there and the location service took me for a wander over to Boots and back again while I was just standing there. This was where uh, my, I discovered using frequent locations on my phone 
that at night time, my phone was going for a walk. It was going over, I lived somewhere over there, and it was going to sort of, well, somewhere around, well, up here, sorry, and it was taking me 100, 400 yards away at night time for a few hours or a few minutes. I took a set of photos there over ten, five or ten minutes at home, and there's a fascinating journey as it bounces backwards and forwards to about that location, and finally, eventually, after ten minutes, got itself there. And then that one, I was at a conference last month, uh, it, when was that? <coughs> this year, um, down in, in Montreal. I was standing somewhere around about there on the top of Montreal by the big radio tower. First photo I took, five kilometers error. Then some other stuff as well. But it was just noticing that something curious and bizarre was happening. And it seemed, hey, here's something really simple that students can do. They can actually do a lot of interesting reading, find out some of the technologies, <coughs> and then capture dead easily 200, 300, 400 photos and find out where they were. And that builds us a nice database. As it happens at the moment, we've got 2,700 points consolidated. We've got lots more coming. I've got three, something like, what is it? Uh, nearly a million data points probably coming. Um, at the end of the month from China, where I've got 300 students, well, a colleague in Shanghai, they've got 300 students who are going out on a, a beginning of term exercise, and they're going to ca capture hopefully 300 data points each. So there's a lot of data coming from there. But it was just noticing something interesting in my domain that they could also do easily. And then they can do the numbers, the statistics, ever so simply. And so we've got three, three or four things here. One, this was the first time we ran it. And this showed the different um, phones, which was this. This was a, uh, a Nexus, Galaxy Nexus and an Apple iPhone. Quite different levels of accuracy. A second student discovered that if you go out into the car park at Kenilston Road, busy, Saturday when it's empty, same point, three photos, down here, that height, and that height. This lot was between four cars. <coughs> that was the same point, no cars. Hugely different levels of accuracy. Here was one thousand meters error at six inches above the ground. Hundred meters error, where you've got four cars around you. <coughs> <and> <coughs> So Farrandig found something interesting. Different technologies, different ages within HTC over about three generations. As you can see, the accuracy profile for one averages around about 20 odd meters error. The other one, a much older, which is RS, totally different error profile. First time anyone had discovered that. Most of the, when they did this, about the only research you could find about location so accuracy was 20 to 40 uh, data points plotted in, I think it was Los Angeles. And it showed how they were out of place. Tiny uh, little bit of research. That one piece of research was more than we could find anywhere else in the world. And then Amna Almot Mutawa, who was one of our really bright Qatari students, was looking and just accidentally realised she took the same, stood at the same place and took photos by a location uh, tag every few minutes. Yep, initial startup error goes down to around about 10 15 metres accuracy, and then at somewhere around 8 to 10 minutes, a massive error blip. So she then decides she'd capture all of her data in half a dozen or a dozen places and see what happened with time. New information. So the consequences from this is lots of student publications. The URLs are here for you. We had a co-authored paper with three undergraduates um, at the SAS Global Forum um, last year. This is the interesting reputational one, the next one. As a result of some of those presentations on location services accuracy last year, 
ultimately, these five organizations who run big commercial uh, conferences around the world have started coming to me as their only academic. Most of their speakers, if not all of their speakers, uh, are business practitioners. The University of Derby now has the reputation Informer is in the telecoms field, IQPC is in the sort of retail and other types of conferences. Management events is a rather interesting one because they work at inviting audiences only from the C-suite. Chief exec, chief data officers, chief this, chief the other. And they invite me and they actually then pay my expenses, uh, hotel fees and so on. Hennet Group is in manufacturing and ERP and so on. And 31 Media is a new one that came out of the blue a couple of months ago in software testing. And not only that, I'm now being phoned up by these various people. Richard, we're putting on a conference on such and such. What do you think we ought to be including around the governance and uh, data science analytics field? The only academic, as far as I know, who is being involved in that. So that's a fairly impressive reputation for the university. And finally, on the domain expertise side. We are doing some very, very interesting work in terms of big data, data science, analytics curricula here. And we use a couple of very, very important world leading analytics suites. There's lots more, and we're using some of those as well. What are the consequences of what we're doing? And I bring in other people around here, people like uh, Mosen and uh, Fionn and Dave for his and one or two others who are working in this field. So we're, we're a team developing some really interesting undergraduate and master's curricula. I've now been co-chairing the annual, originally IBM sponsored <coughs> Big Data Analytics Educational Conference Series. I've had faculty awards for the last three, four years now from IBM. Uh, I'm now the one of the founding members of Watson Analytics Global um, Academic Network. We have got the only university in the country with free access for all of our UK-based students to use Watson Analytics for manipulating data. We can, they can handle up to a million rows of data in their, this offering, and they have it for th five years from the time they sign up. So they have it for two years in their professional life as well as their three years of pure academic life. Program committee membership as well, and editorial membership um, in journals. <coughs> now, what has driven a lot of that has been using the internet fairly effectively. All of those commercial conference organizers have found me, I think, by LinkedIn. So we have computing.derby.ac.uk, which is a website that Dave runs, which is the now the um, slightly informal website for electronics, <laughs> computing, and maths. If you want to have your own web page there, uh, you have complete freedom to manage it yourself professionally. You get an access ID from Dave and a password and um, authorship capability. So you can build a tree structure of your own web pages as big or as small as you like. Okay, you still put some of the stuff onto the University of Derby official one. Um, but this is the one, uh, or these two are the ones which are going to get you noticed outside. And I found the value of that one, the time we had one of these events last year, I think it was, it might have been the year before, I forget which, um, out at, that was the year before, when we were up at, um, not Cromford, but the one before there. And in the middle of Nick's session, I got my first email, would you like to contribute? And that was within, not about three or four months of getting, beginning to build <coughs> all of that, where I've now got <coughs> all of my conference presentations there present both in terms of title, slides, and many times the video as well. That's where you can find all of my lectures and seminar videos and conference videos. 
And we're also running a rather interesting, or developing a rather interesting um, website, again, hanging off computing.w.ac.uk, but with a different login and so on, um, which we set up as a result of the last year's Big Data ed uh, Educational uh, Conference uh, with various colleagues. And that's beginning to get a bit of traction as well. So publicity leads to consequences which lead to value for your students, for yourself, for the university. The students love being involved in your research. There are not many universities or departments where, we, where undergraduate students are so actively involved in research. We've got other colleagues, like Asma has got colleagues, uh, students, who are helping you to publish, aren't they? They're giving you the data um, and papers and uh, co-authors. It is very rare, if you look around the conferences we go to, that any of our colleagues' papers have undergraduate students as co-authors. It's incredibly valuable for them. And it bucks them up no end to see, I've got a research paper on my CV. It makes them stand out. And if we're looking to inspire our students to excellence, inspire our students to achieve more than they thought they could achieve, these are some of the things that help. And they respond incredibly well to these sorts of challenges, to this sort of recognition. Because if you talk to, when you go out to placement visits and talk to the managers, you get the picture that most of the students who they get, get through the interviews, well, they're all technically about the same. So how do I make a choice? What makes them stand out? Publications helps. Whether it's the basic ones, their articles which are good enough to be up there, which are probably good enough to be at our international conferences as well often. Because we, we all know just how bad half of the papers that get submitted to international, journal, international journals are. I get horrified at times when some of the papers that academics are submitting to the journals I'm involved with, I wouldn't even expect that level of low quality at first year, let alone second year, let alone academics. And we've got stuff coming out here that is much better than most of that. And that surprises them, because they come to the University of Derby, and they've probably seen Derby as 70, 80, 50 in the league tables, so I can't be terribly good. But now, I know I'm not that bad because I'm doing leading edge research. I'm contributing to academic publications. Just a short set of thoughts about what can come from an interesting sideways approach to the concept the scholarly activity feeding into your teaching and learning and assessment strategies and student excellence. Thank you very much. Has anybody got any questions for